All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the regular scheduled Tabor Town Council meeting for January 23rd, 2023. We'll call the meeting to order and ask for the adoption of the agenda. Councilor Firth. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Council adopts the agenda as amended to allow for the opportunity to undertake closed session items prior to the timing of delegations at 5 p.m., as well as to add item 10.3 to close session uh, and citing uh, advice from officials 24-1B of the FOIP Act, consul consultations or deliberations involving officers or employees of a public body. All right, thank you. Amended motion on the table. All in favor? Chair unanimously. All right, uh, I know uh, Councillor McLean was unable to attend this evening. I'm not sure about Councillor Beckering. Hopefully he will be here at some point. We'll carry on with the meeting. Item uh, number three, public hearings. There are no public hearings. Adoption minutes. Item 4.1 minutes. Regular meeting of council, January 9th, 2023. Mr. Tebow. The regular meeting minutes from January 9th are in front of council for their consideration. Thank you. Any questions arising? Comments? Councilor Rudd. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move that council adopts the minutes of the regular meeting of council held on January 9th, 2023 as presented. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Chair unanimously, thank you. No business arising. Bylaws number 6.1. First reading for land use bylaw amendment 2 2023. Mr. Tebow. Just looking for a first reading on this tonight, and we have um, Selena available if anyone has any questions around this particular amendment. All right, thank you. Councillor Rudd. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions, Mr. Mayor. Um, on, on just having a look at the map and everything uh, um, and the, the narrowness of the lots, uh, I was wondering if emergency service access had been considered. Because I, I know we, we, we had a review on that at uh, another development to make sure that the trucks could get in and turn around. So that's been done? We're okay? Um, I do believe that would have been done at the initial stage when they were creating the subdivision and that's gone through, through two land titles. Okay, thanks, Mr. Weaver. I see uh, the chief is nodding his head as well. So, uh, another another issue. Um, uh, just in the wording, they, they talked about the any any uh, new land use changes uh, would have to be contextually compatible with what's around it. So, I'm looking at the map, and and and, and maybe I should have gone up and had a look at it too. But uh, on the one side of the street, you've got. That's where, that's where the uh, change is going to apply. But on the other side of the street, there's, uh, it looks like, yeah, it looks like big chunks of land. So um, they're kind of diametrically opposed to each other, big piece and little piece. Mr. Mayor, um, Council, they are contextually compatible. Um, they're both residential. Um, the size of the land and the lots isn't specific to being compatible. Um, that lot could be broken, the big lot could be broken down in the future, or it could be developed in a, um, like, a more dense residential use, like an apartment building, something along that line. It, so we're looking specifically residential use compared to, say, adjacent to a industrial use. Mm -hmm. um, so the R3 that's turning to R2 would be um, adjacent to another R2 parcel behind it, and then R3 along the rest of the cul-de-sac. So um, most of the uses are the same. The only use that's really quite different is that single family dwellings are discretionary in R3, um, and they are permitted use in R2, and those particular lots that they're rezoning to R2 are better designed for single family homes. So this way, each of the applications could be a permitted use instead of needing to be discretionary and go to the MPC meeting for approval. Yeah, there's not a ton of difference between R3 and R2 anyway, so. Okay, thanks very much for that. All right, thank you. Any other questions arising? Councilor Sorensen. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Hi. So, um, if I read this correctly, they could put one dwelling or two on that lot? Mr. Mayor, Council. Um, for an R2, you can only have one dwelling. Um, they could put a suite on. That's where they could... Um, do that. And R3, again, um, 
is a little different. R4, I believe, is the only one where you can have more than one building, like dwell, dwelling building on a unit that isn't actually a suite. So you could have multiple apartments or multiple semi-detached on an R4, but an R3 and an R2 are slightly different. Okay. If, could I just have a follow-up, please? So I was just wondering, there was no specific lot sizes. So are they meeting the kind of area uh, requirements for that? those developments over there? Mr. Mayor, Council, yes, they do meet the minimum width requirements and the minimum size requirements for an R2 lot if they're being rezoned to that. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Any other questions arising? All right, so I'm prepared to make a motion. Councilor Sorensen? I'd be pre pre prepared to make that motion. That council gives reading to bylaw uh, 2 2023 to amend a land use bylaw 13 2020. All right, thank you. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. On to action items item 7.1, write off taxes. Mr. Tibble. I believe Mr. Orwa is going to come up and speak to the write offs. Notice in the background, there's quite a bit of explanation there, but Mr. Orwa is here for anything further. All right, thank you, Mr. Orwa. Uh, thank you, His Worship, and <coughs> members of council. So, before you, uh, the tax, tax write off for 2022, and uh, this time I tried by giving a uh, lot of explanation there. And uh, um, if you look at some of them, maybe some of them are self explanatory, but some of them probably might throw in some little explanation. If you start with number one, uh, that first roll, uh, those are just penalties. And the taxes have been fully paid. And it looks like um, that account has become inactive. What that means is linear, tax, linear assessments come from the province. And when it becomes inactive, we don't know exactly what transpired out there. But they did pay their taxes. It's only that the penalties were not paid. And it's been there for a while. Uh, the second one, um, Again, that is also outstanding from 2020. Again, uh, this is uh, town-owned land that was leased as right of way. And so far, you know, that business also went under. And we've been trying as much as we could to collect. And again, we failed in those areas. So they're not going to pay their taxes. And then if you look at number three, uh, that is now we come to the meadows. So initially, when the meadows was done, it was done as one big parcel. And of course, that is the outstanding taxes there. And one, one thing that I would like to mention that is, uh, although according from that agreement, all the taxes are supposed to be paid by the town, but even if we write off the municipal taxes, we still have to pay the senior and the school taxes. Then number four, again, that is just supplementary tax, you know, as we bring those homes into the lot. Uh, those ones are also assessed. So again, that one we'll have to write off. Now then the last one, the last one is now the provincial. Now I did attach the last letter that we got there. I don't know, maybe if you've gone through the letter. Uh, this is where initially we started by um, 70, we were being given 75%. Then of a sudden now we're only getting uh, 50%. So 50% we have to write off. So those are the three roles, of course, that is the provincial building. We have the courthouse and, of course, uh, the Eureka Warner building out there. So those are the taxes that we are requesting council to write off in 2022. All right, thank you. Any questions arising? All right, someone prepared to make a motion? Councilor Run or Sir Councilor Sorensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm prepared to make the motion that council approves the write-off of tax balances for the following roles. Can I, do I have to say them out loud or can I say as listed? Okay, as listed, please. All right, thank you. Councilor Firth, you had a question? All right, oh, thank sorry. you. sorry, right. I should probably finish that off for a total amount of $39,555.10 to be right. written off as December 31st, 2022. 
All right, thank you. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carry on. Thank you. Item 7.2, funding commitment for Tabor Arena renovation modernization. Mr. Tebow. So there's been a grant that's come to the attention of administration, and uh, we'll get Mr. Kusigan to speak to that if there's any questions. Um, we're basically just looking to get council's approval to go ahead with the grant initially. Um, and then um, Chris will explain some of the details around what it looks like. All right. Thank you, Mr. Egan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council. Um, so in 2017, uh, MPE consultants provided a condition assessment report for the small ice surface. And in that report, they indicated there was about a million five in repairs required to uh, bring that uh, particular ice surface into uh, a state that would be fully functional. Um, as uh, Mr. Thibault noted, Infrastructure Canada has put forward a grant opportunity for green and inclusive community buildings. And our current plan, which is very preliminary, would see uh, us modernize the existing Civic Center building, expand and replace the small ice surface with a standard NHL size surface uh, with some seating, and then upgrade many of the building systems. Uh, the grant opportunity provides uh, an 80-20 split, up to $10 million, and uh, that scope, of, general scope of work will take us close to uh, that limit. So what we're seeking today is approval to at least proceed with the preliminary planning and submit the grant. Uh, the grant, if we're successful, the grant agreement obviously will come forward for council's approval. Uh, but uh, we wanted to make sure that you were uh, aware that, that if we're successful, there will be up to $2 million worth of uh, funding requirement from the town. All right, thank you. Any questions arising? Councillor Bruin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So we're not looking to choose an option or anything today. We're just trying to get this grant. Yes, it's going. just to make you aware that we that can apply for this grant. Yes. If, if we do are successful with it, then we we would enter into uh, a full design agreement yep. with uh, consultants and move through the planning, design, and construction process as we normally would. Yeah, I know it's hard to believe, but 2017 is six years ago. So I can imagine these prices have just more well, doubled since then. Yes. Things has changed so, absolutely. Councillor Sorensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Do you anticipate that we would be able to uh, achieve our goal with the 10 million um, available? Uh, yes. So right now our preliminary estimates indicate the replacement ice surface to move from the small ice to preliminary would be about five and a half million dollars all by itself. Uh, that would leave a sufficient amount of uh, funding left to then move through the building systems because the, the grant is a green building grant as mm -hmm. well as inclusive communities. They are looking for a specific uh, energy savings uh, information that we, so part of that we'll spend the, the, uh, the remainder of the grant mm -hmm. to whatever that is to tackle those particular issues and modernize the building uh, yeah. to produce those results. I think this is great and I'd be in favor of moving forward. All right, thank you. Uh, do you have a question, Councillor Rudd? Yeah, my first instinct was uh, carpe diem, let's do this. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I'm still of that mind, <clears throat> but I, I just want to pose a question, and maybe the CAO can weigh in on this as well. Um, there was some discussion at our inter-council meeting, if you recall, uh, about uh, facilities in each, each of the concerned communities, and uh, not... Um, and I, I, I bring that up just to, to say that I think we should make it a, an agenda item for that next meeting of that committee to let them know what, what we're doing here with this. So if that would be agreeable. Yeah, so um, we did take that into consideration. It, it, wasn't, it was a, something that came forward after we had our joint meeting for this type of a grant. Mm -hmm. To us, for us to apply to, so any other place could also apply for this grant uh, as well as us. But yeah. certainly, there's still a multi-use facility opportunity that would exist between us all for a uh, dry land facility, if nothing else. And so, I think there's still plenty to talk about. But but absolutely, we would let the rest, uh, the other communities know if we were successful with this grant, yeah. what that means for us and them. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm after, so that they're in the loop as well. And that's 
Well, well we, that is the nature right. of that discussion. So, okay, that, that's all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It would be very public anyway if we were successful. For sure. And just to confirm, it's, it does allow you to do, if, if we're able to be successful, the full amount, uh, the uh, large ice service plus a variety of renovation improvements with the existing building as yes. part of that. We'd be looking to go through the entire building. Okay. The grant Great. covers the, the whole facility. And with the total of the $10 million is a maximum, but is that, uh, might you get something lesser than that also, or? Yes, the grant yeah. uh, up to $10 million, the split is 80-20. Right. Over 10 million, which uh, if you wanted to build a new facility, you could do that within this grant structure, and the split is 50-50 at that point in time. What I meant, is it, is it solely a $10 million grant, $10 million grant period, or could it be lesser than It, it that? can be anything up to $10 I million. I see, dollars. okay. Okay, We're, we would be going for the maximum, of course, and if ideally we to get that, uh, great, yeah, okay. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Thank you. All right. Councillor Sorsen, are you prepared to make a motion? That's all right. Wrong button. <laughs> <clears throat> um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I make a motion that council directs administration to pursue the Green and Inclusive Community Buildings Program grant from Infrastructure Canada to modernize and expand the Civic Centre and acknowledge a potential commitment of up to $2 million in matching funding from capital reserves. All right, thank you. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. On to item 7.3, information for council. Mr. Thibault. So this is just a quarterly update that administration is providing uh, based on a previous council request for our capital projects. Uh, so it's just for information, no motion required, but feel free to commiserate or ask any additional questions about something that you might think is there or isn't there or, or anything like that. All right. Any questions arising whatsoever? <laughs> Councillor Rudd? Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, I just want to know how, how this compares to the, pro we, we have a 2023 capital project uh, schedule and budget and um, does, does that compare to what's on here, like in, in terms of the carry forward projects? So there's been no carry forward projects brought on here. That would be something separate that John is still preparing uh, from a financial perspective. Okay. And the rest of administration will have input on. So no, that's not this. This is just, uh, it's really exactly the same capital projects report we saw last time with some few different, you know, completions and percentage updates and things like that from previous projects up to and including 2022. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor Sorensen. I just to like, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to just um, acknowledge um, administration and I love to see that we're complete and under budget. So that's great planning on their behalf. All right. Thank you so much. All right. No motion required on that particular topic. Uh, item 7.4, standard item council requests. Mr. Thibault. Unfortunately, I thought I'd have some updates for one of the items or any of the items on this listing, but I do not. Um, so they are just still in in progress. The rest of the f of uh, the floor is council. If there's anything that you've come up with, All right? Thank you. Any questions arising on what's on the current list or any other stand item council requests? All right. Seeing none, we'll move on to department reports. Go through those individually. If you have a question, please stop me accordingly. First is Planning and Community Services Department Report. Finance Department Report. Engineering and Public Works Department Report. Public Works Treatment Facilities Report. HR Department Report. Fire Department Report and Administrative Service Report. Councillor Rudd. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Now, just a question. Um, I spent some time going through all these reports, and as usual, I'm, I'm really impressed at the, <clears throat> excuse me, the volume of work and, 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 the, and the efficiency that goes on, and, and uh, that's what I read in the reports, and then when I'm out and about, I, I see it in action, and it's really nice, so I appreciate this update. I was just curious on the Administration Services uh, uh, comment about receiving many FOIP requests. I'm just curious what the general nature of these would be 
and um, when, when we're looking at them, is there any way we can uh, improve our public access to information to avoid that? So, just all right. Thank you, Mr. I don't, I don't, I don't know how many is many, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm not sure either, to be honest, Councillor Rudd, but uh, Mr. Tewell. Um Miss Van Ham is, is most knowledgeable in that area, so I'll get her to speak to what she can around that. All right. Thank you, Miss Van Ham. Good. Well, thanks for the question and the interest in Foyt, Councillor Rudd. Um, we don't get a lot of them. We're probably going to get one a month for specific things. Generally, it involves um, requests for preparation, potentially, of land sales for phase one environmental. So they're looking for spills, all you know, that kind of thing, fires, any background that we have on that land. So, okay. yeah, yeah, and and probably we've had maybe in the last you know couple of months which is which is high because generally it ranges around one month or so okay that's what's happened. fairly no, not noxious great yeah, <laughs> all good. right thank you <laughs> councillor Sorensen. thank you mr mayor i just see under finance that it says deliver internet for Tabor minor hockey i was just wondering if that how that is affected by finance all right uh thank you mr orwa Yeah, but I think there have been a lot of discussions that have come up. They wanted at least uh, to see if at all uh, finance, I mean, the IT side can play some role uh, on the other side in terms of anything that is required, like IT related. Finance, correct, yeah. So in anything that is IT related, the discussion is on and they wanted to find out how we can assist in that area. So that's why it falls under finance. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I know it was brought to the rec department, and so I was wondering how that, if it was followed through, and if they received that then? I, I'm going to guess that, yes, I think it was, I can't remember the service was called Barn, Barn something, but it is operational over there. Um, so yes, IT assisted in being able to help us facilitate their um, stream, live streaming system at the rec center. Majorly it was the live stream, that's where they were involved. All right, thank you. Any other questions arising? All right, no motion required for that. Uh, on to Mayor and Council reports. Councillor Firth, would you start us off, please? Just finding my notes. Um, I attended all of the meetings I was required to this month, including the Chamber of Commerce meeting um, and plug for their annual dinner and awards uh, is coming up this Friday, January 27th at the Heritage, and I believe that there's probably still tickets available if anybody was interested. I um, also attended the Traffic Committee, um, Police Commission meeting, as well as an information session for the Colaire Institute. Um, sounds like some really interesting information coming out of there. Um, it's a post-secondary type concept with for egg um, education and training. So looking forward to see where that goes. Um, also attended a joint meeting between Tabor Town Council and Coaldale Town Council um, and the Tabor Titans event that uh, was on this weekend. I attended the concert and it was very well done and sounds like they raised a lot of money for our community. That's all I've got. All right, thank you. Councillor Sorensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was gone on a vacation for the first week, and then I was unfortunately ill for a week, so I did miss some meetings. Um, however, I just wanted to um, uh, mention to fellow council members that um, I'm going to be attending the uh, Economic Development Association Conference April 12th to the 14th in the Kananaskis. I attended last year and I find it, found it very uh, valuable. Um, and so I was just gonna share that with everyone if anyone else wants to join me. So again, um, yeah, that's all I have to report. All right, thank you, Councillor Rudd. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I was at that combined council meeting in Coaldale as well. Uh, I was unable to attend the uh, uh, Southern Alberta Candidates Association AGM. Uh, our handy bus meeting was rescheduled uh, to uh, later in this week. Um, <clears throat> I attended the TCAPS meeting. 
and I also attended the Interim Municipal Development Committee meeting, and I uh, tuned in to the Regional Health Advisory Committee <clears throat> the three-hour virtual meeting, and it was very informative. There's a lot of work going on in uh, trying to improve the, the delivery of health services in Southern Alberta. Uh, it was a, a really good cross-section of people that, that are on that committee, and uh, an invitation showed up in my mailbox, so I went for it. <laughs> and uh, not, nothing startling, but they are um, uh, starting to attract more physicians to this area, and they, they filled several positions and uh, looking for more. Thank you. All right, thank you, Councilor Bruin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was uh, sick for a little bit. I'm sorry I missed last meeting, but I'd like to thank Council again for the lovely flowers. And I think we should probably start off the floor shop with the times you guys have sent them to me. Um, <laughs> I attended the MPC meeting, uh, Coldale Council meeting, joint meeting we had, which was very good. Um, Intermunicipal Planning or Development Committee meeting with the MD, which is also informative, and uh, that's about it for me. Oh, I would recommend that everyone reads that uh, food corridor report that was emailed out to us. A lot of work went into that study, and it uh, really shows the uh, benefits of twinning the highway and the potential we have in this area with the food corridor. All right, thank you. And for myself, uh, I've attended a variety of meetings as well. I uh, met with uh, uh, our CEO, Mr. Tubal, and our Mr. Orwa on a few occasions as well. Dealt with a variety of document signings and uh, uh, the usual paper requirement flow. Um, also attended the Filipino Christmas party. Uh, another event, uh, the Beast Deck New Year's Filipino get together as well as the uh, W.R. Myers Basketball Alumni Fundraiser event. I also did attend the Coldale Joint Meeting with fellow counselors, and uh, I did attend the uh, Tabor Titan Fundraiser to promote the, the youth sport and health to moat. In, uh, in that regard, a very well attended and very well received event. And that would be my report. Uh, any other questions arising? Councilor Bruin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm wondering, I yourself and Deputy Mayor Firth attended the Ag Education uh, meeting. I was unaware of that meeting. I wish I could have attended, but any news back from that or what they're looking for? Or I was unaware of the meeting. I'm sorry. So. I'm just trying to think. Uh, the Ag Education meeting. The institution. Oh, sorry. Yes, we did. That's right. Correct. I did forget that one. Uh, that was very well done, actually. Yes, uh, that was uh, uh, Sid Tam's uh, presenting, Graham Abella, Chief Abella, as well, and several others that are on that board. And uh, yes, that was uh, that was very well attended, very well informed. Uh, uh, Mr. Tebow was also in attendance here, and I think that's everybody else uh, from Town and Tabor representative, correct? But uh, I, I found it very informative and. They're, they're basically looking to do some educational uh, opportunities in the, uh, the agricultural field and to do with the uh, promotion of this, this ag corridor and everything that's attached to that. And, uh, geez, I don't know, there are a dozen people or something involved with that board, something like that. And as I understand it, uh, there's something official happening tonight for their group. And uh, so stay tuned, more to come that way. But it was very well done, very well received, and some great information, a variety of questions. I think very preliminary to this stage. Mr. Tebow, would that be fair to say? But Yeah, I think this was their sort of first public engagement. Sid sent out the invitations to uh, to whoever. There was a few MD uh, residents there, or sorry, MD counselors there as well. That's correct. Um, yeah. There was no real ask. It was more informational than just trying to outline what they're trying to achieve, basically. All right, thank you. Councilor Bruin, you have some other questions? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just, I ran into Sid the other day and he kind of caught me off guard. Um, he's asking why the rest of council or council members didn't show up besides the deputy mayor and the mayor. And I said, I'm sorry, I, did, I wasn't aware of it. Was it sent to all of council or? Uh, no, no, actually it was uh, advised of us uh, on a council meeting night, so everybody was advised then, uh, but I think I understood you were in the hospital at the time when yeah. this was going no, I was on. Out, so I think. I, no, I'm sorry, because I've been involved with Sid and Graham okay. on this, and I didn't know about it. So. 
I'm sorry uh, I missed it. Well, okay, that's okay. But as I said, I think that was the only reason we, I, I informed council uh, individually uh, who was here in attendance that night, but uh, yourself and Councilor Sorensen was also not not available here. Okay, so no, that's okay. how, how that came about. If that got lost in the shuffle somehow, but that was the understanding that you were not available. Um, so uh, no, that's the basis. It looks very promising, so it's good. It so does, it does, more, yes. More uh, we can support a lot of council. great information. I like their ideas and I like their their drive and their vision. So I think they got a lot of great possibilities going forward. Thank you. All right. All right, moving on. Our delegation are due at 5 p.m. So we got a little time for that. Um, can we deal with um, some of the closed session items? So go into closed session and then be able to come back for five 5 p.m. for the, the delegation attendance. Councillor Sorensen? I'll make a motion for us to go into closed session. All right, thank you. Motion on the table. All in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, moving on to our delegation item 8.1, Delegation Scotia Bank presentation. Mr. Tebow. I'm told that we have Mr. Rob Gray and Ms. Sierra Nuno here to provide the information in front of you. You did get an updated package versus what was emailed to you in the original council package, which is the hard copy in front of you, and an additional handout from Scotia Bank. All right, thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. You're both welcome to either stand or sit. Uh, either microphone will work, but if you do, if you're presenting, just at, uh, turn the mic on when you are presenting, okay. please. We'll probably you just, we'll probably stay yeah. standing and go. Back. Okay, as you say, it's just to that that button in the middle. You just have to. There you go. Perfect. Ah, oh, there we go. Perfect. Awesome. Great. Thank you. When you're ready. All right. Well, thank you so much for having us out today. It's a pleasure to be here. He's Rob. I'm Sierra, <laughs> and we're visiting from Scotia Well. Um, today we're going to chat a little bit about municipal investing. We're going to get a bit of a market. Um, and share some of the strategies that we employ with our municipal clients. So we'll start with a market update, which um, normally would take about 45 minutes to an hour, and we're going to condense that to about three minutes. So <laughs> I'll, I'll be brief and quick on this. Um, ultimately, we're in a situation right now where um, the Bank of Canada and the Federal Reserve in the U.S. have been very aggressively raising interest rates to combat inflation. Um, and that has got us to a point where we are either on the brink of a recession, which could be a, a soft recession, a hard recession, um, but it is very likely going to be one. And it would not be surprising at all if we look back in February and we are able to look back to November and say the recession actually started in November and December. So that plays a lot into where we're at with with the market right now. We are at interest rates in Canada, they're at four and a quarter percent, US is four and a half percent right now. That has been the most significant increase in interest rates on a relative basis that we've seen in multiple generations. Um, that was done to combat inflation. The challenge with that is that when you raise interest rates at a domestic level by the Bank of Canada, it's to combat domestic made inflation. And the inflation that we're seeing out here that has been uh, plaguing the country and, and the world is not domestic created inflation, it's, it's a global inflation. It comes from coming out of COVID, it comes from the supply demand imbalance that's going on um, with the lack of production able to keep up with the demand that's happening in the world. It comes with the fact that up until recently, China had anywhere between four to five regions in their country at any given time that had a manufacturing output greater than Canada's shut down for two to three months at a time. So it, it, we didn't get the supply pickup that we were hoping to at the end of COVID because um, the manufacturing was just constantly being shut down. On top of that, then we had the Russia-Ukraine war break out and the three main uh, commodities out of that, which was food, energy, and fertilizer, all are global commodities, they're not, um, Canada of any country in the world is probably impacted both positively and negative by this, but um, Ukraine is the breadbasket of, um, of Europe 
and their, their food supply chain has impacted that. Russia is the prime energy provider into Europe. That's been disrupted. And then Russia is both the largest producer of fertilizer outside of Canada, and Ukraine is the largest um, consumer of fertilizer in Europe. And so all of these things created a global inflation that we just have not um, been able to significantly get under control. The interest rates have gone up and inflation has come down. Now, we're, we're just a little bit north of 6% on inflation. I don't think that's actually happening because of um, Bank of Canada's interest rate hikes. What has happened though is it's put us on the brink of this recession or we're at a point where the recession has actually started. We're in a very different situation than the US and it comes predominantly from the fact that in the US, um, mortgages can be amortized for 25 years and the rates can be locked in for 25 years. In Canada, mortgages are amortized for 25 years and rates are locked in for five years. So we're in this unfortunate situation right now where 40% of the outstanding residential mortgages in Canada are up for renewal in the next 12 months. The impact on our higher interest rates are going to hit Canadians a lot harder than in the States where only 6 to 7% of their mortgages are up for renewal in the next 12 months. People are going to go in and they are going to find their mortgages are going to go from $2,800 not to $3,200, but they're going to go from $2,800 to $5,600 or $6,200. And that's going to cause either people getting foreclosed on, that's got either they're going to be selling their homes into a market that is already saturated, or if they are able to make those payments, what they're going to find is that that's going to come out of their disposable spending. That is, all three things are going to have significant impacts on the Canadian economy. Um, I'm going to talk about that in, um, in a way that actually shows the positivity that comes out of this. But what we're looking at is a recession that is probably like a very different recession than anything we've seen in our lives. It's a recession that likely has a lot of employment, which is unusual for recessions, but it's a recession that likely every community will see a lot of people losing their homes during that time. And that's something that hits us all, except people are going to have jobs during this time, which will be a, quite different from what we've seen in the past. That's 45 minutes condensed into three. So um, we can go into more detail on that, but, but that gives you the overall um, picture. And it also speaks then to some of the market-related issues that we want to talk about later. Sierra, come in. Yeah, so I'm going to talk very, very briefly about the Municipal Government Act. I'm not going to go through this verbatim. Um, that would just pain all of us, including myself. Um, but just want to assure everybody that the strategies that we're going to discuss today are compliant with the MGA. Um, so I will start off by introducing those four strategies. So these are strategies that we employ with our municipal clients. This is a long-term investing approach. Rob will discuss a little bit later on in the presentation why we take the longer term view and the benefits of that. Um, but the complete financial strategy includes cash flow matching, a discretionary universe bond portfolio, discretionary government bond portfolio, and principal protected notes. So we're going to go through each of these in detail if you're wondering what is all this crazy jargon Sierra is telling me. Uh, so the first one is our cash flow matching portfolio. So this would be the shortest term of each of our strategies. And it is essentially a laddered bond strategy that focuses on matching bond maturity dates with liquidity events that the town is expecting. So for example, the Tabor flood mitigation wetlands. Say we knew about that 10 years ago, and we know that there are going to be liabilities paid to contractors in three years, in five years, in seven years, and a balance paid in 10 years when the project were completed. Our team would then purchase bonds with laddered maturities that align directly with those dates so that we know that the money will be available. We know it's coming down the pipe, but we don't want to sit on the cash. We want to do something with it. We're going to invest it in a laddered approach um, so that those maturities align with the dates when the town needs to pay contractors and ensures those funds will be available. Rob is going to discuss the next strategy. So that first, the matching liability strategy along with typically ladder GIC portfolios or ladder bond portfolios is what the vast majority of municipalities have been doing for the last 30 to 40 years. Um, based on the current conditions, uh, there are different strategies that will likely be more effective. 40 years ago, we were at extremely high interest rates and we had a continuous decline in those interest rates to the point where we got close to zero. Um, we're in a very different situation that has been seen in the last little bit with interest rates coming up. They might plateau for a bit, but we're not in a period where we're going to see 40 years of declining interest rates. 
So we started doing discretionary bond management. Discretionary bond management means that we get an investment policy statement from a town or municipality where the, um, the parameters, the constraints of those bonds are given to us. It aligns itself with the Municipal Government Act. Everything that we purchase has to be eligible within the Municipal Government Act. And any further constraints that you as councillors may put, and as mayor may put on, um, on the portfolio as you wish to see it. So if you, if the Municipal Government Act allows us to go into triple B bonds, but you're not comfortable with that, then you can preclude that from the, from the strategy. We started off doing a discretionary bond portfolio a number of years ago for First Nations, Indigenous land claim settlements. Um, we've been operating it for about 20 years. Um, and what we are able to do in that is we will buy federal government bonds, provincial government bonds, municipal bonds, corporate bonds. We will extend duration or extend the term of the bonds. We will reduce the term of the bonds. We'll go heavier weighted into corporate, heavier weighted into government heavier weighted from provincial to federal or vice versa. We're able to do that as long as it fits within the constraints of what you give us in the investment policy statement. As we did this over the years, what we found out is that um, for the last five or six years, the portfolio started to take on a heavier weighting into corporate bonds. We had some of the municipalities and counties we worked with said, we're, we're approaching a point where we're getting underweight what they need to have in government bonds. And so we actually created an entirely new portfolio of discretionary that was only focused on government bonds. So it could only be provincial government, municipal government, or federal government bonds. That discretionary allows us to act in a very quick manner so we can do purchases, sales, um, minute by minute. As, as Sarah and I might be on the road doing presentations, we have a chief investment officer back in our office that will be actively managing the portfolio on a daily basis. Those are the two primary um, discretionary portfolios. Um, and I'm gonna let you talk about what's in these bonds. Sure. Um, okay, so the first one, the discretionary bond universe portfolio, as Rob alluded to, this is kind of everything <coughs> under the sun. Any high quality triple A to triple B bond, um, so whether it be corporate, whether it be government, um, and then obviously precluding anything that the town decides is maybe outside of their interest. So we've had clients get a specific as saying we would like to exclude pipelines, you know, we don't want to go to that sector of corporate or insurance companies. Um, so it's really whatever the town wants to see. Thank you. Um, as Rob said, it's actively managed day to day by us. And since it is discretionary, we have the autonomy to seek and seize the best opportunities that exist on the market um, that also fit in with the town statement. And then moving along to that government bond portfolio. So this is exclusively high quality government holdings, as you can see some of the logos behind me, um, which was developed in response to evolving IPS requirements of other clients who just needed to see a little bit more government representation and a little bit less corporate. This helps us ensure that a certain weighting is maintained for the town, um, should you see fit. All right. So the next strategy, so we're on number four now, we've made it to the end. This is usually um, the one that's a little bit more outside of the box. We're gonna spend a little bit of time here. So principal protected notes. Um, I'll circle back a little bit to the MGA. The MGA stipulates that municipal investing has to have principal protection. The return is not specified in the MGA. So principal protected notes behave like a bond in the sense that their principal is guaranteed at maturity. However, unlike a bond, the return is variable, and that's going to depend on a couple of things. The terms of the note, the performance of underlying securities, those things are going to de determine return. So there are two different types. Traditional, which have a set maturity date. They have a performance, which is tied to some underlying index. Um, so unlike bonds, this is giving you complete diversification uh, away from being tied to interest rates. You know, what is the Bank of Canada doing? all of our other holdings, whether they be GICs, whether they be bonds, they're all tied to rate movement. This is looking at it through a different lens, still guaranteed that principal back in maturity, but the return is tied to something completely uncorrelated with the other side of where the rest of our holdings are, whether they be short term or long term. So those traditional ones, their performance is tied to the price appreciation of that underlying index, and there's a performance um, participation rate. So it's oftentimes greater than 100%, depending on how specific that underlying basket is. We've seen ones come up as uh, recently as high as 
Um, it depends how specific those underlying holdings are. And then there's another type called an auto callable. Rob's gonna go through two examples of these so it won't get too deep into it, but basically this one, you're not getting some multiplier on an underlying index, you're getting a set amount. I'll use an example of one I saw recently. It was 11% set amount return to the municipality if the underlying index were at all positive on the call date of that note. So you purchase it today, a year from today, if that underlying index is at all positive 0.1%, you get 11% return, you get your money back. The issuer, which is one of the big six banks, takes the note back, doesn't exist anymore. We look for another opportunity for the town to invest. So I'm gonna leave it to Rob. He's gonna go through two examples. We'll be quick here. I, I think one step away from the hook happening is the, the vacuum cleaner gets turned on. And you, know that you're, you know that you're running out of time when the that vacuum cleaner That was just coincidence, I can say that. But, <laughs> but no, you go ahead. <laughs> okay, so um, these notes, as I said, as Sarah said, they qualify for under the Municipal Government Act because they are 100% principal guaranteed by one of the big six banks in Canada. What you get is a, um, a note that has that guarantee at the, at the maturity, which could be three, five, seven, or 10 years out. And however, an underlying basket of either stocks or a sector of stocks or an index, so an index being the S&P 500 or the TSX 60, however that index performs or the basket of stock performs, we get a participation that is times by the participation rate. So if, for instance, the TSX was up 10%, these notes would be up 24%. That's, that's how it works. What we don't get is we don't get the dividend payment of the individual stocks in there. We, we just get the actual price appreciation of that. What we do is we actively manage these as well. So if we get to a point where you have, say there's $100,000 invested in the note and the index has gone up 20% over, um, over a three year period, even though there might be four years left on the note, if, if it's up 20%, that means the note's likely gonna be up close to 48%. We would look at that and we would say, this is a time to sell the note early. We are able to sell the note early. We don't have to hold it until the maturity. It's like a bond in that regards. And so we can take that extra 48% return and we can get a guarantee around that. We can sell that note by another principal protected note. So the entire principal is now protected. All of our portfolio management is about risk mitigation. So we are constantly looking for ways to, how can we get more of the principal protected? And that's, that's the active management we do on these. This type of note is one that is going to perform best when we see the market going up. Now this gets back to the overview that I was doing of the market and the, and the economies right now. If we are in a recession, um, or if we're close to being in a recession, the good news about that is that typically, if you look historically back to 1950, the markets bottom out two months into a recession. And from that point on, you typically get at the start of a, a relatively good bull market at that point. So a recession, although not great for the economy, actually isn't a bad thing in the markets because that's typically the start of when we, when we see upside, upside um, returns in the market. If we go to, to the next one, um, an auto call note is when we don't think the market's gonna go up extraordinarily, extraordinarily but we do think it's gonna have some slight appreciation in the next one, two, three, four, or five years. These notes, they get called on the anniversary date of the inception of the note. If the market is even up 0.01%, the note gets called. And in the case of this one, um, you would get a coupon of seven and a quarter percent. If after the first year, the market's negative, it rolls into the second year. And if after two years, the market is up 0.01% or greater. The note gets called and you get 14.5%. So you get seven and a quarter for both of those years. In this particular note, that carries on out to seven years. This is actually a live note that we did with a number of municipalities just a couple weeks ago. So this is the actual numbers that we would see out there. Um, this is one where we're less concerned about the market having a long, um, prolonged return and more just, do we think it's gonna be flat? and then eventually have some type of positive return. We're able to tie these to anything from a basket of stocks to a sector, so it can be pipelines, it could be banks, it could be insurance companies, it could be the indexes, the TSX 60, the MSCI. So we can get geographic diversification, we can get sector diversification. Interestingly enough, 
Um, the three big cities in Alberta, Calgary, Edmonton, and Medicine Hat, they don't need to do these for their equity exposure. But they're actually now, we're in discussions with them because based on the year that happened last year, they actually like the downside protections of these. So they've never done them in the past because they didn't need to do that for their equity exposure. But now they're seeing the benefits after a year like last year where that, that downside protection speaks volumes. Another interesting point, and I'm gonna step away from the principal protected notes. This is a way to get equity exposure when to fall within the Municipal Government Act. But there's also reasons right now to increase fixed income exposure as well. Um, there have only been four negative years in the bond market since 1980. The average return, average, the year after a negative return in the bond market is 13 and a quarter percent. So that's an area that we're able to um, go into we, with our discretionary portfolios. We can manage around whether we should be corporate long, government, government short. We manage around that. But the average of the market in the years after is 13 and a quarter. When does that typically start? It starts after the last interest rate hike. We're expecting the last interest rate hike. We, we don't know this with certainty, but it certainly sounds like it. Um, the last interest rate hike will probably happen this week, and probably another quarter point. Um, and then it seems like the Bank of Canada is willing to take their um, foot off uh, the pedal at that point. So um, I think that's everything we had. Is that right? Hopefully it was to? timely and we can just discuss with you guys some of the opportunities that are out there if you take a more long-term <coughs> approach to investing for the town. All right. Well, thank you so much both for your presentation. Rob and Sierra, appreciate that very much. Very informative. Have any questions? Absolutely. Are there any questions arising? Yeah. Councillor Rudd. Thank you. You got some pretty big numbers up there. I mean, my mind is going, what? what you know, what, I got to go rush home and change my investments. You know, because you're, I mean, 29, 50 percent coupons. What does that actually mean? I don't understand. I don't understand that. Okay. So if let's go back to the example. Um, the this one is, no, the, go to the auto call. The, this one is, um, here's the details of this note. It is at seven years, it's 100% principal protected. So the note itself could go up and down during that time. We know if we hold it till that point in time, we're gonna get 100% principal protection. All we need is on any one of the individual anniversary dates of that note is that it's up 0.01% or more. And if it is, whatever bank issues that note, so it could be Scotia, BMO, Royal Bank, TD, whatever, they will call in the note and we get the seven and a quarter for each year that the note was held. Now, tip... Even if it doesn't even if it does yeah. yeah, even if it does Yeah, you, you could be down... Yeah. For each of the four years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I want to add as well, I think it adds some color to these notes. Um, I've seen the back testing. I've gone over it pretty regularly, rigorously with the team in Toronto. So for this underlying index in particular, because people always ask themselves, well, what are the odds of that happening? Um, big stocks bored in that respect. Um, so the way that this note is structured, I've seen the back testing since the 1980s. And in the, by the sixth year, 100% of notes have been called. So it's fairly likely that on one of those anniversary dates it will be called. The average hold time is about a year and a half. So we're looking out for those opportunities where we see it's, it could potentially be called and we're looking out for it to know that the town can purchase the bucket. <laughs> for, the, for any issuer, so we actually access notes from the big six issuers. We're not coming to you, you know, as Scotia Wealth, kind of limited to Scotia notes. Um, we're a team that will, will bring you bonds and also structured notes from all of the major six banks. Okay, so Rod, one of the key things on this is the structured note desk of all of the big six banks. So not just Scotia, but all the big six banks do these. Now, we deal with all six of them. We don't deal just specifically with Scotia because we are Scotia. We buy from all six of them. Once they set up the note, they're setting it up through forwards and futures contracts. But that, that's not where the guarantee comes. That's what gives us the return. The guarantee comes from all the big six banks making it a guarantee, just like their GICs, just like their bonds. And that's what it qualifies it for as a municipal government act. Because it's, it's not guaranteed by the future contracts, it's guaranteed by the bank itself. 
that no matter what is happening in the market, the banks have put that 100% principle. Yes, exactly. Exactly. All now, right. you, I, I will preface this too because we're summarizing a very complex subject into 15 minutes, and we've spent hours with John on this. This is not, it's not something that we've only spent 15 minutes on this. We've spent, and, and I can tell you he's, he's asked us very rigorous questions along it. So we have shown him all the sheets that show the, you know, where we come up with the calculations and what the structures are and lists of the different options available. So again, we're summarizing something that's pretty complex into a short period of time. All right, thank you. Councillor Sharson. Thanks, and probably John already has asked this question, but two questions. Um, obviously, there's maximums that you, uh, a community can invest in certain portfolios, then we can't just invest all in one particular type of investment. Is that true? Absolutely. Well, and that's decided by yourself. Um, and it's, the Municipal Government Act doesn't put restrictions on how much you would allocate to various things. But in our work with you as we're creating an investment policy statement for if, if you wanted our assistance on that or anyone's assistance on that, what we would look for is the, the first place we start is the matching liability. What are, what are the known um, cash costs that are going to be happening? Because those ones, we want to have funds maturing at that time or your, or your GIC portfolio that has funds maturing to meet those cash costs. Once we get into the money that goes beyond that, the money that um, is still sitting at the end of once you've kind of gone through the tax cycle and, and there's still a, a investment portfolio there, then we start looking at, well, how much is, is appropriate for the discretionary all universe portfolio? How much is discretionary for the all bond portfolio? And how much is appropriate for something like principal protected notes? All of those portfolios have liquidity in it. The 100% the discretionary universe and 100% discretionary bond, if you needed all the capital in three days, we can sell the entire portfolio and have it liquid in three days. On the principal protected notes, typically when you're buying into these, they're, depending on the note, there could be a three month, six month, or 12 month hold period that is, is a minimum. So generally when we look at this, it's the highest expected longer rate return, but it's also the portion that we would say, this is the, this is the last dollar that we, if we were forced to sell everything, this is the last one we want to sell. That's the, the logic that we go into it. And again, picking an appropriate amount that fits for, for Tabor. If I can ask one more. Sure, you bet. It sounds too good to be true. Is there a cost to the community or to the taxpayers then for so this type of investment? There, there's fees on the, um, and again, John knows the details of these fees, but it's a great question. So on the matching liability portfolio, we are generally charging 0.1% per year to maturity. So a one-year bond, 0.1%, a five-year bond, half a percent, a 10-year bond, 1%. There's no, there's no cost on the sale of those bonds. Um, so whether it matures or whether it's sold, there's no extra cost on that. On the discretionary portfolio, whether it's all universe portfolio or whether it's the um, all government portfolio, it's 0.2% or the assets under management, okay? And there's no, there's no charge on any of the individual bonds that could, because we're doing discretionary trading, we could do 10 trades in a month, we could do two trades in a month. So there's no extra charge on that. It's just a 0.2% for the assets under management. Yes, annually. Um, And then the final one is the principal protected notes. On those ones, what happens is whatever issuing bank is constructed that note, they pay a, um, a sales uh, commission to the investment firm. So they will pay directly, so whether it's Bank of Montreal, Royal Bank, CIBC, or Scotia, they'll pay Scotia McLeod, which is who we work for. Um, those fees range from one and a half to two and a half percent typically. Now, if you're investing $100,000, though, the 100000 from Tabor is still fully invested. The reason that the hold periods exist, the three-month, six-month, or one-year hold periods, is because of that fee. That's, that's the whole reason there's a, a minimum hold period on those. But there's no cost to sell, so if we come in 
and we suggest that two years into a note, the index is up 10%, there's a 240% participation, and so the note might be up 20 to 24%, and we suggest to sell. It's the same as the matching liability where there's no cost on selling it. So we're not, there, there's no, um, if we're making a recommendation to sell, it's because we think it's in the best interest of Tabor to, to realize that gain and then get more under principal protection. But th yeah, there's the comment on the too good to be true is um, it's once the banks actually create this structure, it's not a situation where the bank wins if the client loses or vice versa, where the bank loses if the client wins. They've set the structure up with the, in the forward market and the futures markets, and they just have their 100% principal guarantee, and they have hedged their bets. So at, at that time, when we go to sell a note, um, if, if that's what is chosen to be done, um, the bank just unwinds it. It doesn't, there's no, there's no loss to the bank. There's, so they're not on the opposite side of the table in that regard. So, yeah. All right. Got all the questions covered, I think, pretty much. All right. Well, thank you again once so much for your presentation. Very informative, and I uh, can't thank you enough for all that information. Thank Got you. our head spinning quite a lot, for sure. Like, well, we writing. appreciate it. I can tell you that we spent a lot of time with John, so he yeah. was... <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for your Perfect. time. Great. Well, Thank we, you. We expected 15 minutes, so that's uh, we're, <laughs> we're thrilled. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. You too. All right. On to uh, media inquiries. There are none. None whatsoever. It's not a big surprise. Uh, then I would ask to move back into closed session, please. Uh, Councillor Sorensen. I'll make a motion to go back into closed session. Motion on the table. All in favor? Here now, say thank you. I move that council direct administration to initiate negotiations with the parallel church for the purchase of land at the corner of 51st Street and 47th Avenue and establishes the key parameters, scope, budget, and schedule of the land improvements to construct a park at the location. All right, thank you. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Here now, see, all right, thank you. Item 10.2, Councillor Bruin. Yes, you were. 10.2? No, I got that. Where's it, Councillor Rudd? All right, Councillor Rudd. I move the council directs administration to proceed with the sale of a 1.34 acre lot um, at uh, 5766 Avenue and accepts the offer to purchase for $195,000 as presented. All right, thank you. Motion on the table. <clears throat> Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried okay, now. Thank you. Just a motion to close the meeting. Councillor first. I move that we close the meeting. Motion on the table. All in favor? Carried okay, now. Thank you.